Well, welcome everybody uh, to Ripped from the Headlines, Writing Contemporary Crime. And I am so excited to introduce to you um, your wonderful slate of panelists this afternoon or evening, depending uh, upon where you are. So on that note, we're gonna start with Ian Rankin, who is uh, ready for bed at 11 p.m. In, in, in Edinburgh. I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. Uh, um, and so we're, we're grateful to him for joining us. Uh, Mindy Mejia from Minneapolis, she's sitting there. And David Haggerty is in the Bay Area. And Kathleen Barber, is in Washington, DC. And Hank Ryan, of course, is right outside of Boston. Uh, so welcome everybody. And I wanted to start off by, whoops, um, by talking a little bit about incorporating technology into your current works. And it change, it's changing so quickly. And the things that the forensics and just the technological tracing that's able to be done now, um, how has that made your writing more difficult in coming up with a puzzle that can still be a puzzle even with all of these newfangled things that, um, are coming into existence that make crime fighting easier. How do you how do you still get that puzzle? Uh, so, Mindy, why don't we start with you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, my latest book, Strike Me Down, uh, featured a forensic accountant, uh, Nora Trier, uh, who chases money launderers, fraudsters, embezzlers, and thieves across the globe. And so one of the things that she's been able to add into her arsenal, into her firm's arsenal, is uh, artificial intelligence. So they've developed AI um, that allows them to uh, go into a company and uh, the, the computer actually gets plugged in and can learn and can uh, learn the patterns of the communication between the people in that company, try to find where the pressure exists where uh, where the, the the crime occurred and so with any technology though I think there's always a limitation right that that AI technology that Nora has is only as smart as the system that it's plugged into so as soon as the thief as soon as the money leaves that system the AI is no longer effective and I think that's the case for just pretty much any technology that we write about there there are limitations and if there's not a limitation there's a way to hack it um, you know, people are always going to be one step ahead. Okay. Uh, what about you, Kathleen? One of the things, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, one of the things that I have found really interesting about technology is that it really inspires me. Um, my, my latest novel, uh, Follow Me, has a lot to do with, with Instagram and other ways that people can like, follow people on social media. Um, and so I find it really inspiring, but I also find that you have to walk a really fine line between um, having it be something that's, you know, kind of mysterious and something that's just going to be completely impossible to solve. So like when I was working on the book, I was trying to come up with ideas and I'd be like, okay, well, this would be really creepy if this happened. And then I'd be like, well but she would be able to figure out almost immediately who that was by just Googling something. And um, by the flip side, if I tried to address it in another way, it would be completely impossible for anybody to figure out because of, um, you know, if, it, like, if they were using like a burner or something. So I don't know, I, I think there's a fine line to walk. Okay. Um, and David, uh, the situation's a little bit uh, more different for you, but I'm curious, um, your series is set in the 80s, um, and taking into account the technology that was in existence then, did, do you find yourself walking that same kind of line, like between, as Kathleen was saying, what would be creepy yet easy to figure out versus what would be impossible to figure out and not usable as a writer? 
you know, I, I think like all writers, I live in fear of the expert who's going to come in and say, you know, that thing that you used wasn't invented until six months after your novel is set. You didn't do your research. So I, I do try to research the specific time period that I'm writing in. Um, my first book set in 78 and the others are two years subsequent to that. Um, and so I did do a fair amount of uh, investigation into what was available and what wasn't at the time. Um, and it happens that that was just before the arrival of DNA as a primary technology for investigations, which was kind of a relief to me because I didn't have to deal with that part of it. Um, and, but I also did a, quite a bit of reading in newspaper articles and crime stories from that specific period just to see what kind of techniques were being used. Um, I did want it to be fairly authentic, but uh, there's a part of me that kind of ducked some of the new technological advances as well because it was, it was just easier and more engaging for me not to have to worry about that. Kind of like a criminal. Oh, if only DNA didn't exist. <laughs> a little bit, yes. <laughs> what about you, Ian? Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I guess in a way I get to have it both ways because my detective is now in his late 60s and he's an analog guy in a digital world, a little bit like his creator. So he doesn't get any of this new technology. I mean, it's there somewhere working away, but he's not maybe aware of it or using it in a way that the uh, real younger detectives are. He's no longer a detective, he's now retired. Um, in the latest book that I wrote, I took him up to the far north of Scotland. And the lovely thing about that was, having driven that road myself to check, there's no cell phone signal in large parts of that uh, area. And also no police. Um, police stations are few and far between, and the ones that exist are usually locked up. And there'll be a notice on the door that says, to contact a police phone. And you go, I would, but... I can't get any cell phone signal here. So you're kind of at the mercy of, uh, of the elements. And, um, and I like that. I like taking him way out of his comfort zone where none of the, the things he was used to in a modern city suddenly pertained. Um, and at the moment, I'm working on a book that's set in 1972, and it is blissful. <laughs> Bliss, not to have to think about DNA analysis of bones and stuff, and not to have to think about cell phones and... You know, that old cliche of the Hollywood thriller where the cell phone has no battery or they can't, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know, because if you're being kidnapped and you put in the trunk of a car these days, you just switch your phone on and the cops come and get you. Um, so, you know, as crime writers, as mystery writers, we always have to be aware that our readers will know about all these new technological advances. So we need to have at least a little bit of, of um, knowledge of them as well so that we can deal with them in a way that satisfies the reader. Um, isn't always the case. Uh, book, I, I had a book that was reissued last year that had been written in 1988 and had been out of print for 30 years, West Wind, a thriller, a techno thriller. <laughs> uh, the, tech was not, the tech was not very techno. And in that, in the, when I read through that book, uh, I was astonished at how often I mentioned central locking in cars. Now, I don't mean remote central locking where you press a little button and all the locks go down. I mean, turning a key, in the lock of the car and all the locks go down. And it must have been a new technology in 1988 in the UK, uh, because I mentioned it a dozen times. So 11 of those mentions had to come out um, when we reissued the book last year because it was just clunky. I was just so infatuated with that modern, brand new, exciting technology. Okay, Hank, your turn. Well, I love what Ian said because we, I had a book called, I think it's called Airtime, where I thought it was really clever. I thought it was the cleverest writer in the world. And when the publisher reissued it uh, with a great new cover and a great new format, I went through it to look at it. And it was all, my clever plot revolved around people with beepers beepers and I thought oh no you know what am I going to do because I had sadly like a newbie made this whole book rely on current then technology and I had to figure out a way to still use my plot um, because I couldn't undo it and so some people said just leave it leave it leave it people will understand what year it is but I, I felt bad about that so I, I refigured it I refigured it out um, but it's like you could take 
as a reporter, in my, in my book, The First to Lie, one of the main characters is a reporter. And the idea that you can find out anything, I think you have to just embrace that instead of saying, oh, you could find out anything. You say, yeah, you can find out anything, but you can't find out someone's motivation, someone's feeling, you know, someone's desire, the connections that people have, that kind of inward stuff isn't stuff that you can look up on Google. So I kind of just embrace that you can do, that you have all these technology. And, and it, I tell my writing students, um, everybody gets one dead cell phone battery for their lifetime of books. That, that is all, one time, because you can, um, rely on the technology to give you this sort of phony suspense and everybody knows that you're just it's just sort of contrived but just when we were just talking I thought you know you could use technology outmoded technology in a good way by having someone find this great clue and it's on beta a Betamax cassette and nobody knows how to play it what do you think that would work? So I think we should just take this technology and use it for ourselves. Well, as technology is supposed to be, right? But it, you use it for your own purposes. Uh, so the next question I had, I'm, I'm curious in a fun way, have you ever had a plot idea that you ended up not being able to use? because of technology. Uh, kind of like Kathleen was saying, crossing that line and saying, well, this would be super creepy and great, but you'd figure it out in two seconds. So I'm curious if anybody has any specific um, instances of, of that happening to them. You know, it's interesting because I think for, for writers at least, the way to handle a dilemma like that may be just to face it and answer it and embrace it. So if someone says, why don't you just have the DNA done? And you, you, so if a reader is going to ask the question, the writer needs to anticipate that question and face it and answer it. So you just have someone say, I wish I could have the DNA done, but it will never be done in time. Okay. So now a real person has dealt with the thing. You have said to your reader, I understand DNA, but it's not going to work here. And here is a reasonable reason why. So I think we just have to think in advance of how our readers will think and, and answer that question. And then, we can, and then anything can happen. I had a, a, a reader um, comment on my new book just a few days ago, and they said they didn't realize that every uh, criminal investigation, certainly in the UK, um, has, a, has a price tag attached to it. And so you might want to get some DNA from some um, soil that's been left at the scene, but the only lab that can do it is in Germany, and it's gonna cost you $100,000. And they go, well, we just don't have a budget to do that. And people who are used to watching crime shows on TV, the kind of CSI cliche, where it's a big shiny glass lab and they've got as much tech and as much manpower or, uh, or human power as they need, um, and it can all be done inside 45 minutes, the length of a TV show. Um, you go, no, it isn't like that. I mean, you know, this, this soil sample could be sent to Germany and it might take six months to come back. Well, that's not great for me as a crime writer. Um, so all I say is I say, you know, yeah, we've got the soil sample. We could send it away, but we just don't have the, we don't have the money to do it. So we can't do that. Um, to me, that's realistic. Uh, yeah. Although, it, you know, it means that you could end up not, not being able to push forward the plot that way. What about you, Mindy? Yeah, I, I agree with both Hank and Ian. It's, it's absolutely realistic to say that technology cannot solve all our problems. You know, I'm a big a, a Bones fan, you know, so like that TV show where, again, everything happens in about two minutes. You know, they get the answer to everything. They can like analyze this bug that's fed on this body and they know the killer is in Sacramento, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's unrealistic, but I think part of our job as writers is to address that unrealistic expectation in our, our audience to say, yes, okay, we are writing fiction, but it's realistic fiction and we can get DNA, but in, you know, the, there's one crime lab in Minneapolis and it could take up to a year if it's not the case of the week, you know, and, and just educating your reader to say, 
this, you know, that this is actually the reality. This is the fictitious reality, but this is actually the reality that uh, of this case. Um, so I, I haven't actually ever stopped writing an entire book and uh, like let go of an entire plot because it could have been solved too easily. Uh, but I definitely have worked through specific plot points, you know, where it was like, well, this this is could, this could be a question, but that you could solve it with like you know, two clicks of your smartphone, you know? So there you have to find ways to ask questions that are unanswerable in the moment. You know, the, the, the information, the, the data that's available gives you an answer, but not the answer that's going to propel the action forward. So um, it's, it's finding the right question. I think framing the right question um, to get around the technology that's available. But also, you know, the technology could be wrong. People could be wrong. The answers could be wrong. I mean, all those things, it's not, it's just so not infallible. And that's the other way we could, that's the other way we can use that kind of technology to point people in the wrong direction or have yeah. somebody rely on something that they shouldn't have relied on. So again, it's just, it's just another good tool for smart authors to use in a way that's imaginative. So and we're, we're going to come back to lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> um, so chime in here, Kathleen, David. Um, you know, yeah, any say, um, you know, I think if you're writing with a protagonist who's a police officer, a CSI, or someone closely affiliated with law enforcement, then you really have to think closely about that. Um, I, I've never actually done that. All of my protagonists have been quite distant from that. Um, so in my books, the protagonist is a politician. I've written stories where the protagonist was an inmate um, or a bike racer. And, and when you're creating a protagonist like that, you really want to think about what skills, qualities, or abilities do they bring to it? Because they're not going to outthink the cops in the way that the cops think. They have to think in some different way. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, a politician, he doesn't have that kind of technology, but what he does have is the power of public opinion, um, the ability to influence people, to call in favors. And so I, I, I always find that that's a more interesting way to try to solve the crime. Um, I recently finished a story with an inmate who has no technology, no access to any information. He's locked in an isolation cell. So the only thing he has is his knowledge of jailhouse politics to figure things out. Yeah, that's okay. cool. But um, similarly, I don't write books that have um, like detectives or police officers as like the main um, the main characters. I don't necessarily have books where people are necessarily trying to solve a crime. I I more write suspense stories where people are having something happen to them, and they might not actually be knowing what's happening to them at that point. Um, so I tend to approach the technology from the perspective of somebody who, uh, from more of a consumer perspective, and some of you might not know all that much about it. Um, and so to the original question about the um, having scrapped a plot, I, I, I'm not gonna say scrapped a whole plot because it was just in the very, very early stages, but I had this, I had this idea about like ride sharing and how creepy it is that we just like get into people's cars and, and let them drive us around. Um, and the particular way that I wanted to take it I kept running into these roadblocks. And like Hank said, you know, you'd be like, okay, well, yes, this is this is a roadblock that I'm seeing, but how could I explain it to the reader and make it into a twist? And then I just found that I was trying to do it way too much. And that the particular way that I wanted to take this ride sharing idea was just not going to work because it would just be too easy to um, chase things down. I did think of a plot, I did think of a scheme for how to smuggle things onto airlines using the baggage claim system. Um, and when I floated it to the FBI, they said, uh, that would work. And I said, oh, great. I'm, you know, and he, they said, um, but don't do it because we're on to you now. So we have, you, you know, just as David was saying, we have to learn to think like criminals. Which is uh, part of the fun. So. Um, I want to delve a little bit more into some specifics uh, with each of you. And um, Kathleen, I'm going to start with you um, because partially I, you were an excellent Instagram tutorial for me. Um, <laughs> 
with follow me. Uh, I loved it. And um, I am very curious. Were you well versed in that platform before you started writing it? Or was that something that you came up with your idea and said, okay, now I need to go in and really get to know Instagram backward and forward? It's kind of a little bit of both. Um, I, I use Instagram a lot. I've I've always been really interested in the idea of Instagram influencers. I just find it so fascinating that people can kind of commodify their own lives and that people are out there just lapping it all up. So uh, for, for a couple of, probably a couple of years, I've been kind of like not following any specific influencers in particular, but just kind of the idea of influencers in general, like reading articles about them, like, being on discussion forums and reading other people's thoughts about them. Um, so that was kind of what gave rise to the idea. Um, but then once I decided to, to write the book, then yeah, I had to go and try and find out a lot more. Um, for example, like my, my main character, Audrey is um, making her own like filters. And I just didn't really, I didn't know they're called presets, and I I didn't really know much about that. Um, I still don't know too much about that. Like I couldn't do it myself, but I at least know how it could be done. Um, so there there are a lot of small things like that that I tried to learn more about so that I could lend some authenticity to the novel. Okay. And Mindy, going back to AI, which you you mentioned. Um, in Strike Me Down. Um, I'm also curious about the genesis of that. Uh, did you, when you started the book, did you know that it was going to be a piece of technology that this forensic accounting firm had? Or did that, as you got into writing the book, did that develop as a necessity to get you further along within your plot? It, it developed further along. I, I didn't know at the beginning that I was going to be writing anything about AI. I have no experience with AI, uh, but I did work in accounting for 16 years. I'm a CPA, and so my, my original concept with this book was I wanted to make accounting thrilling, and I did, honestly. And you did. You did. The book is fantastic. I loved it. Uh, but um, so the, the, the accountant that I chose, Nora, the forensic accounting, um, I, I'm not a forensic accountant. So I had to learn more about her, about her investigative techniques. And I took a lot of classes from um, the, the certified fraud examiners. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole magazine called Fraud that I subscribed to for a year to learn their techniques, how, how they're finding um, money launderers, how they're chasing money across the world, where the shadow banking industry is right now, you know, what, what islands are the hot spots for it, what's, what governments really uh, enable people to hide their money. And AI was something that I came across during my research. And it was just so cool. And that's, that's part of the fun of writing fiction is because I could just say, yeah, Nora totally has this. <laughs> she definitely has AI. They've developed it. I called it the uh, amazing Inga. And so Inga is like the robotic partner in this firm. Um, and so she definitely developed as, as I wrote the book uh, because she could. It, it made sense. And for a cutting edge forensic accounting firm in 2019, when this was set, um, AI would have been in their arsenal. So it definitely developed as I was writing. I'm, I'm just going to take a moment and point out that Hank was busy taking notes when you were talking about that class. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see her enrolled in uh, forensic accounting 101 here. Oh, uh, shadow banking. It's news, fascinating. News stories wise. Except for, that, except for that pesky math stuff, I'd be right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and David, to go to go back to you, um, as far as and, and I thought it was very interesting what you were saying with the types of of characters that you choose to write that they are not within the law enforcement structure they tend to be more out of it and that that gives you a little bit more freedom. Can you talk a little bit more about that and just maybe the different 
kinds of freedom that gives you and then how you go about getting a hold of some of that technology when you need it for your characters? Um, gosh, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I will say it's a relief to me that um, my character can't look at their cell phone or Google something and get the answer instantly because it forces him to be more engaged with people and with the world. Um, so rather than doing that, he has to go to the library and flirt with the librarian and hope she doesn't recognize him or maybe she does recognize him and that that, that power and influence he has works to his advantage. Um, and so with, e with each sort of clue or each development in the plot, you want to think a little bit about um, how would this person really approach this conundrum? Is he going to call on somebody? Is he going to do it by himself? Is he going to do it in private and secret? Or is he going to try to do it very publicly? Um, and my protagonist kind of vacillates back and forth between that um, because he's trying to hide a, a personal family secret and at the same time investigate it. Um, his daughter's been murdered and he, he's using his, his influence and his authority to try to figure out who did it and then later on to, to figure out how to punish them appropriately. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it... it <laughs> no, no, it definitely. Definitely. Um, well, now, as promised, we're going to talk about lying. Um, Hank, your turn. Uh, so I know, nothing, I know nothing about lying. No, not at all. Um, I'd actually probably call you a human lie detector at this point. Um, so is that a tougher thing to get away with nowadays? Um, you know, there... You can't really manufacture a fake ID anymore. Um, you can't move across the country and just become a different person. Um, you know, with all of these new technologies that keep tabs on you from, you know, the day you get your social security number when you're six months old. Uh, does that make it harder to write a liar? And I, I, so give us your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, 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 in the first to lie, people aren't off, are often not who they say they are. But aren't we all like that all, all the time? Uh, you know, I speak differently to all of you than I do to someone I don't know, or to my boss, or to my husband. I'm, I become someone else, depending on what I want. And that's the key of lying, I think, in the first to lie and in all my books is that there's a motivation and there's a goal and there's a reason that people lie or become someone else in whatever way, whatever method acting kind of way to get what they want. The book came from me going undercover into a doctor's office um, and changing the, had, had the law changed as a result in Massachusetts as a result of this undercover investigation. I was in disguise in a doctor's office pretending to be someone else. Now, I, he lied and as a res you know, to get me to be his patient and to get money from me and to get what he wanted. But I didn't go in and say, oh, I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan from Channel 7. You know, I pretended to be a meek little person who was hoping to get pregnant. And I was lying too. And all I had to do was act like something. And he just had to act like something. But things changed as a result. And that but I was lying for a good reason, and he was lying, for, I was right, lying for the greater good, a good reason, and he was lying for himself. And that's all you really need, I think, is to not go elaborately into technically becoming someone else, but, you know, with, with a passport or with a social security number, you can just pretend to be someone else for as long as it takes you to get what you want. And then when the truth comes out, it doesn't matter anymore because whatever is you want to happen has already happened. So I, rather than playing with technology, I play with you know gaslighting and mind games and psychology, things that you can't look up and that you can't confirm. They just are. That is the perfect segue into my question for Ian which is less about technology and more about changing mores. And uh, especially if you look at Rebus throughout his career, 
um, what he was able to get away with in the first books uh, versus now and, you know, the things he suggests to Siobhan, you know, well, you should go, you know, do this and do this. And it's like, no, 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 you don't, we don't do that anymore. Uh, talk a little bit about that and about incorporating that in such a seminal series that, you, you know, not, again, not the technological changes, but the societal changes as far as policing goes. Yeah, um, I mean, just to kind of, I mean, you know, to pick up on what Hank was saying a little bit, um, I mean, it's, it's, and what you were asking her, I think it's, it's almost easier to get away with lying these days in some ways. I mean, you can go online and pretend to be anybody. And you can you can persuade people that you are the person you tell them you are because they have no way of knowing you're not because they're taken on board um, what you tell them you are through your avatars and and all the rest of it. And it can be very hard to unpick that. And so there's a whole new there's a whole new yeah I mean there's a, there's a whole new raft of of stories out there to be told. And that flags up something else, which is that the things that we're scared of. I mean, crime fiction, the mystery novel has always been fantastic at dealing with the fears of its contemporary audience. Uh, and the fears of its contemporary audience right now are to do with things like AI, to do with things like um, uh, new technology and what it can do, how it spies on us, how, well, should we be afraid of it, we don't really understand it, etc, etc. Our identities can be stolen at any point, our bank can be broken into, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, are only, every, all this is people are terrified of and so that's right for all of us. Rebus, uh, my guy, uh, is, is old fashioned. He, he belongs to a kind of police officer who no longer really exists, um, very much a dinosaur. The way he did things, it, things can't be done that way anymore. In fact, one of the questions that came up on the sidebar was about, you know, what do you do as a, as a, a writer of detective fiction in this day and age when people are looking online and seeing the police beating up people, um, shooting people, Killing people, um, specifically in the right, states. <laughs> yeah, and you, well, I mean, I don't have that. I don't have that problem quite so much because in the UK we've not got that problem quite so much because our our police detectives or police officers don't regularly carry firearms, um, so we have nothing like that amount of uh, of, of uh, murder going on, state legislated murder going on. Um, it does happen. It happens very occasionally, but not as much, and it doesn't get flagged up. Rebus, you know, he's got he's he's got a moral core. He has got a moral core, but his way of doing things doesn't always um, uh, go easily with the way the police now work. So Siobhan is his conscience. Siobhan Clark, young liberal, university educated, college educated, mm -hmm. has to be his conscience. She has to say to him, "Look, you can't do that. You can't get away with that. You could get away with it when we had no camera phones, cell phone cameras, and all the rest of it. Um, but you can't do it now." I mean, in the early Rebus novels, in a a police station interview room, he would slap the suspect about. He'd shove them off the chair um, uh, because he was just annoyed with them. But now he couldn't do that because he's being filmed. Uh, the you know, and, and the film is handed over to the person being interviewed, and he'd soon be kicked out of the police. So yeah, so he's dealing with a very different landscape and, and, it's, and it's a tough landscape for him to get his head around because he thinks he knows right from wrong. But in his world, it is absolutes. There is good and evil. And my job, I think, and also Siobhan Clark's job is to say, no, there's gradations. There are kind of gray areas mm -hmm. in the middle here. And I'm afraid we're living through a period in history where we're becoming much more polarized in our society and our politics and everything else. We're being told there's good people and bad people, there's us and them, yes and no. Everything is, is binary and polarized. And that's the kind of world Rebus comes from. And I would like to believe that there's a world where we can have nuance and debate. And the online world doesn't really allow for nuance and debate. Uh, you end up in a little bubble where the only people you're communicating with are people who agree with you. So you reckon everybody else must be agreeing with you. So you don't get that and you don't get change because if you don't get debate, you don't get change. And I think the crime novel, the mystery novel, the, the thriller uh, is dealing with that and is gonna have to deal with that uh, much more, I think, in the, in the coming years. That there is, I think, an essential truth out there that can be gleaned and the novel has always been a preeminent way of showing us that essential truth of human nature and why human beings do bad things. But um, in the real world, we're being told everything, nothing matters. You can't trust anything. There is no such thing as a truth. Everything is fake, fake news, fake everything. 
Um, and and so I think the crime novel is that's going to be the future. I think uh, the, the the near future of the crime novel is going to be having to take on board some of those big moral questions and big moral issues and dealing with them, which is what the crime novel has always done. It's always dealt with the fears of its contemporary audience. And one of the things that I think about writing about, uh, there's a wonderful book where someone asks an author, why do you write about crime when the world is so terrible? And the answer in the book is, I don't write about crime. I write about justice. And that's how I, that's how I write too. But when you think, you know, many of my main characters are reporters. And the thing that's terrifying about being a reporter, yes, you can find out anything. Your, your job is to ask questions. You, can, you have access to documents. You have access to, you know, essentially clues. But someone who does not have um, a moral filter or an ethical filter can put something on, online, can put something on Twitter or Facebook instantly. And before it can get stopped, and I know I'm bringing up this whole can of worms here, but the access that everyone has to this technology to disseminate information from the standpoint of, of being a detective or a reporter, one of the problems that, we, that they face with that is deciding what's real and what's not real because everything seems, can, everything can feel true or everything can feel not true. And, how, and the key is how do you figure out which is which? And I think that's a wonderful um, element for crime fiction, that idea that people are putting forward something that looks like the real thing, not just, not just fake news, whatever that is, um, and not just faked videos or audio, but, you know, but truth. I mean, I don't mean to be highfalutin about it, but that's what, that's what our goal is. As a, as a detective and as a reporter, um, is to get to the true truth, if, because there is such a thing. Um, but again, it all depends on your point of view. Which is a very novelistic yeah. way, way of looking at things, definitely. Um, anybody wanna go off of that, Kathleen, Mindy, uh, as far as, what's true, what's not. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about using technology just in novels in general is that nothing, nothing has to be as it seems. So, you know, well, you and Audrey character. was a great, to me, Audrey was a great example of that, your Instagram star. Um. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Audrey tried to portray a, a really polished version of herself to the internet that wasn't necessarily the way that she lived her life and that um, attracted some people. Um, and some of the people that it attracted were also not really who they pretended to be. So um, I think that it really allows us to, uh, to make our own truths, which is kind of dicey. Well, but when you, when you come into a situation with a jury, let's say, when they're offered a, two stories, two sides of the story, and the jury has to decide what's true. I mean, that, has, that can have to do with technology, too. There are phone pings and, tech, and text messages and surveillance videos and all. You, you can't go anywhere without somebody taking a picture of you to prove you were there. You know, um, in, in my book, what you see, surveillance is used for blackmail. We can prove where you were and where you weren't, and we're going to use this um, unless you do X, Y, and Z. So, um, yeah, and like the flip side of what you were saying about like juries and having photos and everything, um, if you can't prove that you are somewhere that you wanted to be, people assume that you can prove it, and if you can't, they just think that you're guilty. And I think, um, to, to go off of what Kathleen was saying, that the most interesting part is not the lies that we tell other people, it's what we tell ourselves. And that at some level, we all believe our own BS. Uh, my, my first job was in a county jail, one of my first jobs. And the old cliche about inmates is that they all will claim that they were innocent. Um, and that's not true at all. I think I met two people in seven years who claimed that they were factually innocent. But what they would say is, you know, I did it, but it's not my fault. And then they had this really elaborate rationalization for why, you know, the woman made them hit them or they had to kill this guy or whatever it was that they did. Um, and it's those self-deceptions that I think are the most interesting thing about the character. 
um, and that you can really play with so that, um, you know, if you have someone playing a sleuth role and they're interviewing somebody, don't just have them lie because they want to get away with something, have them tell their version of what they really think happened. Um, and then when you have five or six different people all telling different versions of the same thing, then you get this really interesting nexus of trying to figure out, well, okay, what is the objective truth if there is such a thing? Um, and in an era when we don't really have objective truth much anymore, I think it's equally, it's probably even more important to, to look at those different perspectives and, and how we each view things through our own filters. Mm -hmm. Mandy? Yeah, I think it's interesting how we've come full circle here from, well, you can't really lie anymore because you can't have a fake ID or you can't, you know, their, their technology prevents us from lying. And now we've come to the idea that everyone lies constantly. <laughs> and to ourselves, I agree with what David said, that the, the most insidious lies we tell are the ones to ourselves or the ones that we post on Instagram, you know, presenting our lives in a certain way. Um, I'm a mother. I've lied 40 times today, just as part of my job, you know, in raising kids. <laughs> Okay. I think it's really fascinating how how we have to use we have to use our our facades, our you know the the lies that we tell ourselves and each other's to to navigate and navigate through a gray world. I, I agree with Ian too. It, everything has become so polarized, so black and white. Um, you're you're either with us or against us. Everything is completely binary right now, or that's how it feels, right? That's the lie that's being presented to us. And yet, if you ask all of us here right now. Uh, we probably would all identify somewhere in the middle. You know, we, we would all identify personally as not part of that binary system. And so you have the lie of what, what's being given to us, um, you know, just in general that we're inundated with on a day-to-day -day basis. Part of, I think, my job as a novelist is to get to the truth through the fiction, um, to tell a story that resonates in the reader, that, that they can see themselves in, and they understand someone that they didn't before. They, they understand what it would be like to be that victim, to be that perpetrator, to be the community that has to absorb the crime. Um, that's, that's really the heart of what I'm always trying to do. And we talk about unreliable narrators all the time. Aren't we all, isn't every narrator unreliable? And every reader reads the, that unreliability or that author or that character's truth a different way. You know, the, you could have a character who will tell you the truth as they see it. They're reliable to them. But what they're saying is not true truth. It's their truth. And, you know, I, I love to explore that. What is, what is truth? Is it what you believe? Is it what you wish? Is it what somebody tells you? Is it what somebody tells you over and over and over? What, what does that even mean? And that's the fodder for such a good novel, thinking about um, that situational truth. And is, is that even possible? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Like, everybody has their own version of the truth. And even though Everything, everything, something, like, if somebody's like saying that this color is, you know, blue, everybody might have a different word for the, for the color of blue that it is. And just all those different slight variations in the truth when combined make for an interesting story. And what if you try to convince someone that what they, that the facts that they know are, exist, but they don't mean what they, what you, what they think they mean? I mean, take the same puzzle pieces and put them together in a different way and you get a different picture. Turn the finished jigsaw puzzle over. What's on the back of that is another picture. It's the other side of the story. And that's what I think is so fascinating to explore in our books is that we know that the readers have expectations of what a character is saying and which character is, quote, reliable and which character is, quote, a bad guy. And our, you know, what's so compelling about what we do is that we can say, that's what you think, reader. Now look at the story another way. Well, I... I would love to get to some of the great questions that are popping up in the chat here from the audience. Um, although I'm going to be a little bit selfish and start off with one of my own. And this kind of goes again to the situation we find ourselves in today uh, with everything going on. And I'm just really curious, Ian, did when you came up with the title for 
the one who just came, that just came out. Was this, was the title in place before the pandemic hit? Did it come as a result of being on lockdown? I just, I, I'm, I'm very curious as to the timing on such a fantastic title. Um, thanks. I mean, a song for the dark times. I got the title in September last year. And in September last year, I thought the world was going through some pretty dark times. Um, we had wildfires everywhere from the States to Australia with the rise of the far right in countries in Europe and elsewhere. Brexit was ongoing in the UK. We were tearing ourselves apart over coming out of Europe as a trading partner. Um, stuff was happening in the States. I don't need to tell you what was happening in the States, you know. I just thought those were very dark times. And I came across this quote from Bertolt Brecht, the playwright. Um, someone says, you know, when the dark times come, will there still be songs? Yes, there will be songs about the dark times. And I thought, perfect, that's what I'm writing about. Little did I know how dark <laughs> the times were just about to get. So no, it's not a prescient title. The book was written during lockdown. I was lucky, I was blessed in two ways. One, that I did all the research before lockdown started. So I drove up to the very far north of Scotland where a bulk of the book is set and did all the driving around and looking at stuff. Uh, and two is that I decided to set the book in the summer of last year, not the summer of this year. Otherwise, nothing would happen. My, my main characters would be in lockdown. Nothing would, you know, they would be solving nothing. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird. And uh, what had happened was, I mean, I, 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 how do I get ideas for books? I go to my big book of ideas. I've got a folder in my office, and I go and rifle through it whenever there's a deadline looming, and I look to see what I've got in there: scraps of paper, ideas, character names, situations, puns. And there were a couple of cuttings, clippings from newspapers and magazines to do with internment camps in World War Two. There were over a thousand of these in the UK where we basically locked up anybody who had a weird sounding surname. Now, I know you did it as well in the States with, you know, German people and Japanese people, you name it. We had over a thousand of these camps. And if you were a, an ice cream, you know, vendor with an Italian surname, you were locked up. If you were the German delicatessen owner, you were locked up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it just resonated with me. I just thought we're kind of heading that way, especially in Europe, we're heading that way. We've been talking about this polarization. We're being told that we can't trust anybody, that anybody potentially is our enemy. Um, and especially with Brexit, being told Europeans are not your friends, they're not your partners, et cetera, et cetera. They're different from you. They're alien. I just thought we're heading that way. So this book gave me an opportunity to discuss that big theme by having Rebus, my detective, go up north because his daughter's partner has been has been involved in an archaeological and local history dig of, a, of one of these camps and has gone missing. Um, and in piecing together what happened to her partner, Rebus also gets a flavour of what the UK was like during that period in its history. And the reader gets a resonance that maybe this could happen again if we don't tread very carefully. It's interesting because the <laughs> level is, you know, how you can read something in a different way depending on the time. But one of the elements of the first to lie is what if there is a medication that really helps a lot of people, but devastatingly harms some of them? You know, would you take that? Would you take that medication? How much should we be told about that? And how much do the pharmaceutical companies know about what they're selling and how much do they tell of that. Now, you know, that's not the pivotal thing of the book, but now when I look at it, I think, gee, isn't that what we're thinking about so much now? And I wonder, you know, if what, what we're all writing about has these universal and, and constant themes, no matter when it is in the time that we're reading it, we see the book through the filter of what's important to us right then. And if we hit on those themes, that's what makes the book, that's what makes people connect with the story. Uh, I've got a great one here for you, um, which is, if you could pick a character from a previous book that you've written, who was suddenly, thanks to some kind of technology, found to be innocent, how would you write that? Like you, you put away a killer 
you know, three books ago or two books ago or 10 books ago. And now suddenly because of, you know, you name it, whatever, DNA, something not invented yet, whatever, that person has been found, you know, to be wrongfully convicted. Kathleen's got to take this one to completely, right? Um, yeah, so my, my debut novel, um, Truth Be Told, which was originally published as Are You Sleeping, is, is actually about a podcast that is investigating somebody that they believe has been wrongfully incarcerated. And so that guy, Warren Cave, um, I'm not going to tell you if the podcaster is, is successful or not in um, proving Warren Cave's innocence. Um, but if, for example, Warren Cave were innocent, um, his crime was set in the 1990s. And so a way that I would change things would be I would have possibly, if I wanted, to, if I wanted him to be innocent, I would have had somebody in the neighborhood with, with a cell phone camera. Um, that could have shown that either Warren was off doing something else and there is, you know, definitive time things that would, that would prove that he was there then or show somebody else coming and going from the Berman house at the time of the murder. I think that would probably be like the easiest way to do it. There'd be a lot of ways to, that, a lot of more fun ways probably that I could come up with, but on the spot, that's how I'd do it. Well, you know, there, I saw a question in the I saw a question in the chat about have any of us used real life stories as a jumping off point for our books, and this is sort of connected with that. Is that in my book, Trust Me, began as what if Casey Anthony? Do you remember Casey Anthony, the Casey Anthony story where she was accused of killing her three-year-old daughter Kaylee? Um, and I thought, what if Casey? And she was what if what if what if Casey Anthony? really was guilty how would that how would that have played out since she was found not guilty in the trial um how, so how did she how did or how did she get away with it or how was the how was the jury wrong and then i realized you know i don't think anybody wants to read about that but i you right but i took the thought of it and morphed that into in, into trust me again, a study of truth and lies and how the jury assesses the truth and what happens to the person who was accused of something when there's no way for people to prove what happened or what didn't happen. And it's all about telling a better story. For, um, for my, oh, oh yeah, yeah, David, go ahead. Um, it's called They Tell Me You Are Cunning. Um, I was inspired by the Innocence Project, which was a, um, a group students from University of Northwestern or Northwestern University who exonerated 10 people from Illinois' death row and they did it principally using DNA evidence. Um, in, my, in my telling of it, because it happens before DNA, I didn't incorporate that. I had someone who was wrongly accused and had to be exonerated through other means. Um, but if I were going to do it in a, you know, even a few years later, I would want to use that kind of technology to, um, to work on the case. I think for me, though, not having that availability, it was more, it made it a little more interesting to write because then I had to think about, well, how is he convicted and therefore how can he be um, found innocent without any kind of uh, investigative techniques? It's going to have to be strictly based on some evidence that was in existence or some new testimony. Um, and so my, my character, Duncan Cochran, has to go back and re-examine every element of the trial and re-interview all the people who were involved to try to figure out where the, um, the mistake occurred. And isn't that so interesting? Because this is what we were talking about, isn't it? That you have all this technology, but still it's about human beings and how human, the human mind works and what we miss and what we put together in the wrong way. So you can use all this wonderful technology as building blocks, but really it doesn't exist without people's interpretations of it. And you know, David, that's what makes your books fascinating. That what, that's what makes them one of the things that makes them work is that we are all, um, we can all make mistakes. We can all misperceive something. We can all come to the wrong conclusion. So I'll do two more um, audience questions. And one is just pure out fun that uh, 
if you could come up with a future technology, either you have a book set in the future and you need a technology for it, um, or it's a technology that your character is, is working to invent, perhaps, uh, what would that technology be? Um, you know, whether it's a forensic thing or whether it's flying cars or whether, yeah, Mindy. Yeah, I'll go first. I actually invented a technology in my first book, which was called The Dragon Keeper. Uh, it was about a zoo and I had something called a Sarah Adreno microchip that was implanted into every animal in the zoo. They were called SAM chips for short. And they monitored the, the serotonin levels, the adrenaline levels of the animals, and basically made it a, a zoo that was very hands-off in terms of a person to animal contact. I haven't seen that out in the wild yet, but I'm guessing it's only a matter of like a year or two and we'll all be implanted with SAM chips. <laughs> That's, that's kind of brilliant. I, that's, I mean, my, you know, my future technology was only um, having computer spam be carrying secret messages for the people who knew how to read it. So I thought that was my idea for, and I, in one of my books I did that, and that's one of my ideas for taking something that's annoying that we think is one thing and actually making it be something else which could be either scary or good. All right. Anybody else want to jump in? I think I'd like a truth serum that we can apply to politicians. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, no. I would like a cell phone that doesn't need to be recharged. Oh. <laughs> that would make my life a lot easier. I was sort of thinking about, is there a thing that can help me? I, I wind up using my landline to call my cell phone to find it. You know, that's why, that's why I have my landline. Uh, one last question, which was, please recommend a good book to start with of, of books that you've written, of one of yours that would be a good place to start, say, if a reader has not read you before. This was a, a great one from the audience. Um, I'll just chip, I'll chip in straight away and say black and blue. Um, it was the first book of mine to have any kind of success in the States. Um, it was shortlisted for the, uh, the, the, the Edgar, uh, was it the Edgar? I think it was the Edgar. Um, anyway, it's, it's the end of the apprenticeship and the beginning of the really good Rebus novel. Oh, that's interesting. Tell, say the name of again or put it in the, in the comments. Black and blue. Yeah, I will do. Sure. Sure. Um, I would suggest people start with Truth Be Told, which was my debut. Um, they turned it into a television series on, on Apple, um, or they, the novel-inspired television series, and they're getting ready to start season two now. I'm hooked on Truth Be Told. I love that. I love that show. So I'm, I'm a big fan. Hooray. Um, my, my newest book, I mean, I, The First to Lie, has got a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Um, it's a cat and mouse thriller, like I always write, but which character is the cat and which character is the mouse? So it's a standalone. And I like to think that I try to get better with every book. So every time I, I have a new book, that's my favorite book and that's where I think you should start. Mindy? I, if you haven't read any of my books before, you could start with Everything You Want Me To Be. It's, um, it's kind of my first breakout murder mystery, and it's just, you know, a heartwarming murder mystery. Good <laughs> old-fashioned tale of uh, murder and deception. So start there. David. Um, for me, I'd suggest that the first book in my series, They Tell Me You Are Wicked, because um, everything that happens there off after is touched off by the events of that book. Okay. Putting this in the comments for folks. Um, we're almost right on the dot here at four o'clock in the Pacific. Um, I cannot thank you all enough for spending part of your afternoon or late night here with us um, at uh, the 2020 VoucherCon uh, with all its, its virtual glory. Um, so thank you all so very, very much. And thank you to 
all of our audience members and the great questions and the great conversations that were going along on the side of the screen. Those were great. And um, I hope everybody had a great time. And um, yeah, there. back at you, Ian. Thank you so much. And thank you, Claire. Fantastic job moderating. Great moderating, oh. Claire. Thank you. So, and what thank about you, your book? What about your book? Oh, um, I write the Hankworth Mystery Series. Um, out right now is A Deadly Turn, and the fourth one in the series comes out in January. It's called yeah. Fatal Division. Can't wait to read it. So thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next